Hi, I'm Sebastian. I'm giving a talk about how not to break RT, like not what not to do in order to make it worse for your application. Um, my voice is bad. I could lose it. I hope that I do not. It's just you know. So let's start. Um, we tried to mainline RT for quite some time, and the idea basically mainlining it means we would um, be part of the upstream release and all other people using the kernel would be aware of the changes we made. And once everything is upstream, I, one wouldn't have to necessarily make any changes from release to release, like upgrade the whole queue, just basically use what's already there and maybe do some slightly ch changes because things broke during the merge, like things happen from time to time. And then we could also do the test against Linux Next and see fallout early and not at the end, by the time I get to rebase the whole queue. So this is basically the whole motivation behind it. And um, from our team point of view, we don't look at any specific subsystem in particular. Um, what we look at is the user land. We want to schedule user land as fast as possible from, from the point in time when the application wants to be scheduled based on the wake up. Um, to the point um, where it's actually got scheduled. And to make that happen, we remove um, preemption disabled section and interrupt disabled section as much as possible. And to reach that, we do um, a few tricks, more or less. Um, the ground thing is locking, like spin lock and RW lock T is uh, a spinning lock. In RT, this is changed to more or less a sleeping uh, behavior. This is similar to what MutexT offers already. Um, the differences are that um, the task state is preserved. Like if you do ptrace and the task goes into the tracing state um, and then acquires a, 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 the spin log, it sleeps, but the tracing state is preserved once it wakes up. And this is like an um, important difference because then from outside, you don't see a difference if it was a sp if the task went sleeping while acquiring the lock or not. And even if it sleeps while waiting for the lock, the task is not allowed to be migrated to another CPU, which would happen with the mutex T. And this is important aspect because the spin lock owner, like the spin lock on non-RT is, um, always running, so it cannot be migrated to, the CP, uh, to another CPU. So this behavior is also um, re-implemented, more or less. And this also means that the CPU via hot plug cannot go down while there's a task waiting on that CPU, which waits for the lock. And these are all the little details that are slightly different to a real mutex but are semantically the same what SpinLock T provides. And with the change, the lock owner can be preempted by a higher uh, priority task. Um, one of the things is that if there is a precious lock that everyone goes after, it can happen that um, the task that owns the lock is preempted and the next, next task that tries to acquire that lock gets preempted, uh, get also blocked on the lock. And so one task after the other gets blocked. And this doesn't happen with non-RT because they disable preemption, which means the lock owner remains on the CPU until the lock is released. And to cope with this detail, we have something called auto preempt, where the lock owner remains on the CPU for as long as possible. The only difference is if the high prior task pushes off, then we hand over. Um, back in the previous releases, we called it preempt lazy, which was different implementation. Um, but now mainline tries to get rid of cont resket and solve the problems they have with it, uh, with the auto preempt thingy. So this is where we from RT try to piggyback on it to use the same feature and have way uh, less patches to maintain. Um, interrupt handlers. So since this locks are uh, sleeping, the interrupt, thread, uh, the interrupt handlers are threaded. Most of them, like almost every driver that you have gets a threaded interrupt. Um, there are differences like for drivers or hardware that needs run in hardware interrupt context. 
this implies real hardware that um, handles the system. This includes a few like um, the timer interrupt itself and um, the perf events that we have that trigger usually non-interruptible interrupts. And those have this special marker that you use and mark that those interrupts may not be threaded. And we don't have many users of those. The vast majority interrupts are threaded for the device drivers and they are okay with it. On the other hand, since the hard interrupt controller, a hard interrupt handler must not sleep and has other limitations, the things that you can do in those handlers are quite limited. Um, the next difference is the soft IQ handling. The soft IQ is usually the piggyback after the hard interrupt. The idea usually is um, that you do like the, the important thing in the hard interrupt context and everything else that you still need to handle, you lay off to the soft interrupt, which is then handled with interrupts enabled. So you could still um, go and handle other interrupts before you um, continue with the soft interrupt. This was done before we had threaded interrupts. So semantically, you could more or less move everything to the soft interrupt. There are still uh, exceptions with it. Um, one problem we had earlier was that once you raise the soft interrupt, especially from hard IQ context, which is usually not happening because most drivers are threaded, the timer is a difference, for instance, then the case of UD gets activated because it's the only thread that can continue uh, processing the, the soft interrupt because the hard interrupt has, as I said, limited things that it can do. And once the case of UD was active, it consumed all pending soft interrupts, which meant for RT workload, um, things could delay because the case of UD has get other priority, meaning like every other task, it has get other. So it competes with every other um, task for CPU, while the threaded interrupts have higher priority and are usually preferred. This change in um, recent releases since the networking folks were bothered by the behavior. So now it's changed since um, even if KSFUD is uh, scheduled for running, but it does not run yet, the soft interrupt will be handled right away. And this um, limits a few problems we had uh, on RT in, with this regard. Um, HR timer usually invoked in hard interrupt context as well. Those as well have to be moved and we move them into the soft interrupt context so they can again sleep while acquiring logs and everything else. Um, the examples like the, um, the perf, uh, perf timers or timers uh, used by the scheduler which need to run with interrupts disabled, which need to fire as soon as possible, those have a marker when they need to run in hard IQ context. Um, most of the other drivers are basically fine if, if it's run in a soft interrupt. The timing is more or less the same, the thread is high prior, so it gets um, early scheduled. Um, things like um, clock nano sleep, which is used by the task to sleep for a certain amount of time, is handled differently. For instance, if the task is get other, the wake up will happen from the soft interrupt, which might be delayed. However, if the task is RT priority, then the wake up is done immediately, basically to lower the overhead of the wake up as much as possible. And the task with the RT priority is important, so this one are handled right away. The get other are less important, so they can be delayed, basically not to build up latency if a lot of those are woken up at the same time or close one after the other. The next thing we toggled was um, IRQ work. It had more users than I thought it would have, but um, it was originally introduced for perf, so they can handle wake-ups from NMI, because NMI must not have any, um, must not acquire any logs because they could spin or be blocked by the owner itself. So what happens is that they basically trigger a bit to uh, trigger an interrupt, which then has a lockless queue to add items that have to be processed after um, the NMI. 
Um, this has been used also by other drivers for good or for bad. For instance, PrintK um, needs a wake up for the printing thread or for the KLogD daemon to, um, to notify user land that there are things to, uh, happening that need to be printed. Um, this cannot happen from any context. This cannot happen from within the scheduler because it will break it otherwise. However, doing it from the, um, from the interrupt handler itself, it works. And this is like the thing that um, on non-RT, most of the things are happening in, um, in the real interrupt context. But again, for RT, we have to move it to an interrupt hand, uh, in, uh, in threaded handler um, to serve those. So they can be uh, in the position to acquire sleeping logs and so on. Um, RCU callbacks are more or less the same as with non-RT, but we have um, a tiny little bit of special treatment. Um, first of all, we had to remove them from the soft interrupt because they are sometimes long running, which led to other problems. Um, the callbacks itself can be preempted, which leads to a, to a problem, including that the RCU section can be preempted that um, if the reader is preempted within its RCU read section, um, the RCU machinery stops and waits for it to continue. But on RT, the, um, the high priority task can take over and delay RCU for quite some time. And for this, we required something called RCU boost, basically to lift the low priority task out of the, um, the, the RCU read section and once it's gone, then the things can continue and move on. And then there are also other things that can be used on top, like the callback CPU can be offloaded to a different one, so the CPU that's designed for RT workload can, be, can work in peace and not be bothered by RCU anymore. Um, a few things that work on non-RT but break on RT. One of the things is something I would call spin until ready. Um, the basic situation is that you disable preemption and not explicitly, but you inherit it by spin lock, um, which basically means you cannot go off CPU. And then in this context, you add a special marker that now I'm active and you do one thing after the other. And the other CPU basically or the other thread spins on this active bit and waits until you leave it so it can do also operate on those things. So basically the shared resource is um, more or less locking but done all with uh, own primitives. Now this works on non-RT perfectly. However, RT gets this scenario that the preempt disable that you did as part of spin lock is not disabling preemption, so you cannot rely on those things um, that used to work as is in non-RT. And then you set this active bit by one, and then this other thread gets and preempts you because it's allowed and spins on, the, um, on that bit. And if that thread has higher uh, priority, then this other thread that got preempted gets never on the CPU and you spin basically forever. Um, yeah. Um, those things were mostly found in the um, in the core code, like timer del timer sync has this thing where it um, tries to remove the timer from its list. But if the timer is actually running at, at the time, then it spins and waits until the timer is uh, complete. And from non-RT point of view, the timer can only run on a different CPU. But on RT, the timer could have run on the same CPU and get preempted by the, by the thread that does Dell timer sync, because we do preempt timer and soft interrupts and everything. And the same scenario happens with sec count and other primitives. And for for RT, we had to tackle each one of those and provide something as a synchronization point of view, which means um, if you do Dell timer sync and the timer is running on the same CPU, we need to, um, to make sure that we um, 
flush them out and make sure it completes its thing and then we can delete it just to make progress. And most of the things we did have like unique solutions like for Dell Timer Sug and HI Timer. Um, the difference is for instance for the sec counts since those are usually more or less open coded. Um, we had some uh, effort to generalize the API and make sure to um, pull in the logs they're using simply that we can reference them from RT point of view and avoid the whole spinning situation. Um, we didn't change all the primitives. Like if the driver is using local IQ disable, interrupts are getting disabled. If preemption is disabled, exp explicitly the preemption is disabled. All of those things um, increase the latency if you try to um, schedule because you are not allowed to. Um, most of the users access per CPU variables or something that is local to the CPU. And for most of them, we had to find a replacement how to deal with this without using preempt disable explicitly. And local lock, which was introduced into the kernel, was also uh, often a nice replacement because it handled those things nicely. Um, in regard to this, um, we have more or less a lock ordering. This is doc documented the kernel what types of locks we have, which switch in which direction. And if you acquire them, you usually go from the first one to the last one in terms of ordering. So you go first for the sleeping locks, which always sleep like the mutex. Then you go for the sleeping locks, which sleep on RT and RT only like the spin lock T. And the last one in the section is the raw spin lock. Otherwise, if you go for the raw spin lock first and then the spin lock, then you could sleep while acquiring the spin lock. So this is not working. Um, another thing is that you cannot mix like disabling interrupts and acquiring spin lock because it's not the same anymore. This used to work on non-RT, but uh, things like that break RT. So th those things need to be abstracted or use the uh, proper locking primitives. Um, in general, you could go ahead and try to move everything from the spin lock T that generates a warning and go for raw spin lock T. This in turn means um, that the section is not preemptible anymore. And in most cases, it leads to more problem over time. And the, the code you can handle in those sections are, is limited. And the more time you spend, and the, the scheduling time frame gets longer. And some of those can be bounded by the amount of items you, you handle. And most of the time, the driver is not ending up in the hard interrupt context anyway. So the raw spin lock T is usually not required since most drivers are threaded. So from driver's point of view, it should work with the spin lock T most of the time. Um, and this is what would happen from, from a warning point of view. Like if you disable preemption on your own and then you try to acquire a spin lock and you have um, debug atomic enabled, this is what the kernel will spit on you. And it's really nicely done. It says what, what it is, what it has and what it did expect. So in this case, preemption was disabled by function here and then RT spin lock was, in, um, was invoked. And RT Spin lock is this replacement for spin lock, which is otherwise used on uh, non-RT. Um, moving further, memory allocation is different. Memory allocation means um, with GFP atomic on non-RT, you can acquire memory even with interrupts disabled, with, pre dis with preemption disabled. Um, for RT, we had to make some um, some choices and we ended up that you must not acquire memory if interrupts are disabled, if preemption is disabled. This would require that you need um, non-sleeping uh, non locks further down in the memory locator, which then it gets problematic because you have to inherit all the lock chain down to the body locator where you add pages and remove pages and collocate them, replace them, and this can uh, take up time. 
and we were going like for the whole kernel and auditing things and none of the code really required to have memory allocations within code that is um, running with uh, an atomic context in RT. So we mostly lifted all of those and we had in RT back in the day a few tricks that you could still free memory from atomic context. But by the time we tried to merge it upstream, um, the MM folks were against it. They wanted to get rid of it and we moved on and pointed towards them. And it worked out nicely in the end. Um, one enhancement we got into RT, into LockDep because of RT, is the thing called raw lock nesting. This is disabled by default because it leads to false positives, mostly by print K. Uh, and the bad part is that this already happens during boot if you have um, console printing enabled. And at that point, um, LockDep becomes um, useless because once LockDep finds something, it disables itself. Um, what proof locking tells you is that if you have a non-sleeping lock, like the raw spin lock, and then you try acquire a sleeping spin lock, then it will show it to you like, um, usually like the lock contention things it usually shows, um, that which lock got acquired in which order. And it's basically just a hint for you to, um, to avoid those kind of things. Um, speaking of print K, um, each driver can decide if, a, if it can work with the raw spin lock or the spin lock T is, is doable. Most of the print K work we have, it's outstanding and we already solved in the past, comes from the thing that we cannot use any console driver um, with a raw spin lock. And the reason is this basic um, use, um, use case. Like if you need to print a small string with 20 characters onto the UART, and most of the time the UART drivers, driver stuffs everything into the FIFO and then waits until it gets out. And at this specific baud rate, uh, uh, 115,200, um, it takes roughly 87 microseconds for one character to, um, to be sent out. And the message with 20 characters gets to 1.5 milliseconds, which would mean that the driver disables interrupts for 1.5 milliseconds. And since most people look for um, latency times for less than a millisecond, usually like 100, 200, 500 microseconds, this is not working at all. So for that reason, we have to find a solution to get print K working, but without using um, a raw spin lock. Therefore, each driver can remain with his spinning, uh, sleeping spin lock, and we can still have printing from atomic context with interrupts disabled and with interrupts enabled. Um, now, latencies. Most of the time, they come from context which, which disables preemption for one reason or another. The context is atomic on RT, um, and this can come from um, things like um, cache flashes. We used to have on x86 one opcode which um, flushes the caches of the CPU entirely and invalids them. And this was often used in uh, GPU kind of drivers. And the result of it was that the CPU was off for like 250, 200 microseconds because it had to flush all its caches to the main memory and then read it again. And at that point, the CPU stalled. And this um, was not working. Another thing is um, if a raw spin lock is heavily um, contended and it basically one CPU waits to get a lock and then another one waits. Situation got better with, um, with the ticket spin locks uh, as implementation. But in the end, um, 
if the more a CPU a system has, the worse it gets over time. If every CPU is waiting for it and it waits until each one of them gets the lock, unlocks, release the section and can move on. Um, one example of this thing is um, an example of what happens if you do clock nano sleep, say with 100 tasks from RT task, which has a lower priority than cyclic test in this example. Um, what you see here is um, you have thread number one, which is the important one, which um, I remove all the other information from the output. So basically you see thread one, the PID, P95 as a priority, and there is an interval of 250 microseconds, which means um, cyclic test gets invoked every uh, 250 microseconds. And then it looks, um, when was I, when should I have been woken up and when have I been woken up? And based on these statistics, um, the best case scenario was two microseconds and the worst case scenario was 27 microseconds. And as I mentioned earlier, the clock nano sleep is a function which um, um, suspends the execution of the task and then the wake ups comes uh, exactly from the hard interrupt context. And if I spin 100 tasks, then it means 100 tasks with a lower priority than th than the cyclic test here, but still RT priority gets woken up from the hard interrupt context, which means in this first scenario, it wakes 100 tasks one after the other, and it needs uh, 26 microseconds. And if you boost this up to 500, it's the maximum time it needs is 75. If you go further to 1000, you are at 347. 5000, it's almost four milliseconds. And this is the point that if you have a raw spin lock and a small amount of items you work in your loop, it's, you don't see it as a latency problem. But if you can influence it at some point, then you get more and more work items to work on, then you see it goes through the roof with the latency. And this is like the point where we had to make um, the switch. There are T tasks get working immediately but the get other tasks get delayed to the soft interrupts so they can be preempted like after each wake up so it wouldn't uh, build up the huge latencies. Um, if you end up in a situation that you need to figure out what is going wrong, you have the your cyclic test, you have tracing and you can go and start looking what is happening in my system and um, what is the root cause of the issue we're having? Um, Daniel here came up with the RTLL tool, which basically um, combines the tracing points and a few other things together and tries to help you with um, the analysis. Like what happened in my system? When did it start to go bad? And I have here a link where a reporter came on um, art users reported that he has a latency problem. And Daniel suggested to use RTLA, give it a try, because it was newly merged at the time, I think, like one release or two. And the user had um, the recent release with RTLA. He used the commands and found the issue in the next post, right? Yeah. yeah. So this is the thread everyone can look at and maybe use it one day. Um, another thing we have in RT is priority inheritance. Um, this solves a lot of issues. It mm, makes some words mostly related to soft interrupts. And the reason is that the um, expectation within the soft interrupt framework is completely different than what we have everything else. Um, the basic way how prior to inheritance works is that you have task L, which is the low priority task, and it owns a lock. And then it gets preempted for some reason by another task. Then task H, like the high priority task, wants the same lock. And the only thing it can do, instead of spinning, 
it hands over its priority to the low priority task. So L, the low priority task, is now elevated to a higher priority. And this is only for the time being until the log is released again. And then everything gets back to normal. And the reason is instead for the high priority task do nothing, basically inherit its priority to speed up things so it can get back on CPU and do what it was supposed to do. Um, this is basically um, a, a graphic of it. Like the low priority task is running, then it has the resource acquired, and then it gets off CPU at point three and the high priority task is running. And at, we have middle priority, but this is not important. The important part is that at point five, the priority was inherited by H to the L task. So it got lifted in the hierarchy, was able to run. And after the task was released, it got um, off CPU. So it was waiting until H completed its doing. Um, to see this in action with tracing, this is what it would look like. This is with the um, skets, uh, the sketch switch, and all these scheduling events are uh, reduced to a bare minimum. So you have um, the locking task L, which locked the lock, and then the locking H got woken up. And you see at sketch switch that you moved from priority 89 to 79, which means in kernel terms, the lower number means higher priority. And you see previous state is R plus, which means the task did not um, leave the CPU because it was done whatever it was doing and asked to be to, to sleep, but it got preempted. Then H got on the CPU and asked for the lock as well. And since it was occupied at the time, it did this cat PI set pri uh, priority, which means it inherited its own priority from 89 to 97 for the locking L task. And then since it was the um, highest, highest priority task and H itself had priority, uh, the previous state is S, which means this one goes voluntary to sleep. And then task locking L is the task with the highest priority. It unlocks the lock and then SCAT uh, PI said priority goes back and reverse the, 80, uh, the 79 and we go back to 89. So if you want to see how does it work, do we have it, do I use it in my system, you can basically go for PI set prior and see what is going on. And PI boosting works for most of the logs. Most of the logs are based on RT mutex which means um, the spin lock T, the mutex T itself, all of those have um, priority inheritance within the kernel. For user space, you have to um, use the set protocol uh, function from the libc and set the attribute, uh, the um, priority inheritance. Otherwise, it's the other lock which do only uh, sleep and wait and then the libc handles everything and the kernel cannot do anything. So for priority inheritance user land, um, you need to change the protocol. For kernel, it works everything what we can do, which means RWSM and RWT is cannot be handled. Or it works partially. The thing is that both of them can have multiple readers at the same time, and we cannot boost multiple readers at all because we don't have any handle and we cannot boost two tasks at once from the same log. Therefore, only the, the writer can be boosted by the reader but this is usually never the case. Um, soft IP context is getting worse with priority inheritance. And we have preemption and because of it, what we end up with is a big kernel lock, but not the one that we had in the past, but one that is a big kernel lock CPU wise. Um, the thing is that we have soft interrupts like take soft IRQ at task click and a timer. And what we have is that they may have CPU resources which are per CPU and they are not protected at all. They are not even known that they need protection. But the assumption is since years that once um, soft interrupts is running, 
um, no other soft interrupt can run. And this means the resources are protected implicit. And to cope with this, we introduced a lock lock within um, local BH disable, which basically when soft interrupts get handled. And the good thing is that we remain bug compatible with what we had in, um, in mainline. The bad part is that we can have soft interrupts that build up work and the work is not handled. And then if you have like one networking card that is more important and needs to do things regularly and you have another networking card which is handling bulk traffic like SSH um, for copying large files. And if those things run on the same CPU, then what basically happens is that the periodic traffic from your high important task gets blocked until the bike traffic is completed. And a few things are done in soft interrupts to tackle those things, but none of those are visible on RT because of the priority inheritance. Because what happens is that the um, high priority networking card inherits its priority to the bulk traffic, which then gets run completely for milliseconds or seconds until everything is done. And then after all this completed, the real-time traffic can go on. And this is not what we hope for. Um, I started working to resolve the issue and to add more locking with and soft interrupts so that we don't have this one global lock per CPU but identify resources which are shared and require um, explicit locking. I presented this last year at Plumbers and the networking folks were those ones which I tried to sell this mostly because networking is the highest user of soft interrupts. There is no other subsystem that is using it that, that much and relies on its assumption as networking does. And the idea was to convince the, the biggest user of it and then have everyone moving on with it. And the first two versions were not um, what the community expected. And now I'm working on a rework which should be more or less what they ask for on the, on the RAS review. And yeah, another problem that we end up on RT is basically tasklets is the thing where you can delay work from interrupts to uh, soft interrupts and the same thing is work is doable with work use. Um, the problem is more or less that once your work originated in a specific context like a specific driver, once you hand it over to a work queue or to a soft interrupt, this work becomes anonymous. So you had your threaded interrupt running in a specific priority. You cannot inherit this priority to your work queue and then your work could stall. This is seen sometimes in the TTY driver when you have um, you try to do um, real-time communication over UART because they hand out work to the K worker. Basically, it starts with a high priority interrupt and then it gets to an anonymous context and you have no idea what happened. And for most of the things, um, we try to avoid K worker as much as possible and only handle things that are not uh, time critical. Now, to summarize all those things we have, from driver's point of view, it's usually enough to basically stick with a default pin lock T and avoid everything else where the API, where you put expectation within the API, like pin lock T disables preemption on non-RT. Just don't rely on this having preemption. Try to have a design, a scope, what you need to preempt, uh, what you need to lock and why you need to lock it. And if you need um, a lock that's only CPU-wise, then you can use the lock locks and um, 
and use this for you resources. And also not to add more primitives to soft interrupts or K worker where you lose the power of your execution context. And if you need something to, to spin off work, there are other ways to do it like K threads. And those things add maybe more context switches, but in the end you end up with uh, more power over how you uh, schedule your work in the end. This would be it. Any questions so far? Hello. Yeah, firstly, great talk. Uh, thanks, thanks for that. A uh, lot to absorb. I had two questions. So the first question was, uh, like, uh, what's the vision for drivers? Uh, are they supposed to be the same between RT and non-RT kernels? Or are they supposed to be aware that, yes, I'm running on an RT kernel and make changes? I can think of one example, like, you know, you said in RT kernel, all the thre uh, IRQs are threaded. So now the threaded IRQ has a priority and should the driver care about it and make some, you know, adjustments? Um, the driver should never adjust the priority. Okay. Um, this is decision making. This is department of user land. Because it might work for your use case. Or oh, user land, okay. So user land should find the threaded IRQ and then adjust its priority. If this is needed, yes. If this is needed, okay. That's the strategy, okay. So yeah. the driver is expected to be to be the same, whether used in RT or non-RT, but the user land knows that it's running RT and it makes these adjustments. Exactly, so. yes. Because um, you could have networking and you could have uh, storage. Right. And you could say storage is not as important as then you would lower the storage interrupt or, in, or increase the priority of your networking stuff. And then this is like your use case. Right. So it's application or use case control, right? So exactly. Sort of, okay. And it's not limited to RT. You mm -hmm. can use threaded interrupts as a boot command argument, non-RT as well. Right. Okay. Right. Cool. Okay. My second question is, I saw in one of your slides, uh, there was a screenshot that showed it's a QMU machine. So I was just curious that how useful is QMU for RT development and where can you use it and where should you not use it? What slide? One of the slides you had. Uh, it was it wasn't there yet, right? It was uh, a little bit ahead, yeah, somewhere midpoint, I would say. Yeah, yeah, that one, that one, yes. It did say hardware name is QMU standard PC, right? So. Um, it shouldn't be useful for RT um, because on RT you see if you have sleeping while atomic, then you see all of those. This is useful for non-RT because okay. you see the warnings that you would have seen oh, on RT, RT okay. but without RT. Okay. So this was the motivation behind it. Got it. Okay. All right. Thanks. Oh, thank you. Um, Curious about your mention of libp thread. There was this big problem where Futexes didn't allow priority inheritance that was discussed a lot a few years ago. And you, I mean, is that problem fixed? Is that what you were saying with your um, comment about the p thread libc priority boosting? Or can you give the mic to Jan? Yeah, so the issue is that condition variables in combination with priority mm. inheritance mutexes don't work with glibc. It's not solved in glibc, uh, but RTPI, libRTPI, it's now a package for Debian. My colleagues were working on that. Um, so you can, you can use the library. Um, I think it was once started by Darren Hart. And uh, it should make its way into distributions, more distributions. So Debian has it now in testing, if I remember correctly. And uh, others should pick it up as well, or yok the recipe, so you'll take it. No, my knowledge, no. Fudex 2 is a different department. Yes. The thing is that with uh, condition variables, you need another log. And this was the old implementation of glibc, that you need a log within the conditional variable to add and to do maintenance. And this log was a, a regular log. And this is when you don't have a, um, 
with the priority inheritance and then you go to sleep if you get preempted in this particular spot. And Darren Hart made the patches like years back. And then they got delayed for, yeah. And then um, GLPC upstream reworked that code and now they don't have the lock. So now the, not really, because there is a race condition if you, because you need a lock for, right. And you don't need it that often as you used to have. And to have that lock, they spin on a bit. And I try to reproduce it, but it's tough. But if you out the code, you will say this can lock up. But not as often as you did with the old implementation. Right, just way less frequently, yeah. Exactly. And the library Jan mentioned, um, Darren started on Plumbers, we finished it on in Austria. And then NI took over and I never heard of it again. Yeah, I'm not saying it's not used, but they finish it as far as I'm aware, and they and they are using it, and that's all that's left, my my knowledge. Yeah, Liberty PI is still a thing if you want to use it. I am currently maintaining it. I took over from Darren. Um, it's on GitLab and GitHub now. Is it in Yocto or anywhere? I don't know if it's in Yocto yet. We are using it at NI in Yakto, but uh, I don't know if we ever upstreamed the recipe for it. I don't think so. Uh, but we could, we should. <laughs> that would be great. It's just from the, from the awareness perspective. I saw that also internally. People are generally not aware of that issue because it's now, I think, 16 years old. Um, the Leap C bug is no one knows this, but raising the awareness for that is one of these nice little traps you can leave behind when writing real-time applications and people run into that. So it would be good to have the visibility this way as well. Yeah, I, I did do a DLC presentation in 2020, you can find, but yeah, <laughs> you need more mics. Yeah. So he said he gave a presentation on ELC in 2020. Yeah. Yes, please. Um, my question is less technical, but this demonstrates it. I think, there, by the way, th it's a great presentation and a lot of good information and the, the follow-up conversation. Um, I think I see a lot more, the interest in preempt RT and developing for this is, is picking up. <laughs> um, maybe there's a discussion for us as we go through the day, but for developers that are maybe new and not part of the core where, where do they, where would, should we direct people to, you know, I'm developing an app, I want to do it on preemptor T, where do I get all the, the uh, guidance or the, uh, the tricks in, uh, you know, that sort of thing. So I don't know if anybody has. So we try not to rely much on tricks and everything should work more or less no. out <laughs> of the box. I, 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 well, he's right, we should, but, but, but there is, you know, Maybe we tricks is have, not the right word, but maybe it's, you know. We do have a wiki guidelines. where we document a few things like what you should do, like the priority inheritance thingy, like lock your memory, like how to initialize an application. And sometimes people come with other things and I point them to that wiki and if they come up with things that don't work as they expected to update the wiki or hand me over the materials so I can do it myself. And there is little feedback from that point of view. and. I don't want to blame people, but mostly the industrial people is like, it works for me, I'm done, I'm gone. Whereas the, um, the other open source people, like less industrial, they usually contribute more and or fix up the documentation or things like that. And we don't see that that often. Got it. So yeah, maybe it's something we can, you know, throughout the day talk about how we, maybe we, we point more people to the wiki or, you know, how we do that, right? Good question. I think it is. The question was, is lib RPI on the wiki? And I think it is. Action item, check. You checked. Well, so let me have to do item for today then. Yeah, <clears throat> last question, because then it's time for the... 
said this would be really dumb, but um, I don't have any experience in RT, but I find it fascinating. Um, I'm curious, like, sorry, totally lost my train of thought. Um, wow, totally broken. W where do I learn about, like, why the kernel isn't real-time compatible normally? Like, why do I have to apply real-time patches? Like, it just feels like from the education I got when I was an undergrad was, like, you should be able to make a kernel real time normally, but clearly it's not for some reason. Has anyone written a good article or a good understanding of like why the kernel isn't already real time preempt compatible? I mean, all you need is an interrupt, like hardware interrupt, it takes a millisecond or two because the register isn't popping up right away. And the next thing is you have an IO MMU and you need to map memory and this takes a while. And all those things build up the time the CPU is blocked and cannot be and cannot schedule away towards the user application. I guess yeah, it must have been too long for me because I would think you would just like let the CPU go do something else. Like that's what I don't understand, is like why don't you go do something else while those hardware things are running? Yeah, okay. I mean, the easy answer is it's trade-offs. When you have like the kernel in the preemptive mode, you context switch more and then you added, a, you added an advantage on the latency, but you add a penalty on the throughput. Same thing with locks, same thing. So it's always trade-offs. The vast majority of users are not real-time. That's a reality. So they, they're looking more for throughput than real-time. That's, that's why the preemptive RT was for a long time a pet set because it was, trying to bring this advantage for latency for a, a small community without breaking the, the main community, which is the no real time. So <clears throat> the effort is how can we make this preemptive mode part of the kernel without breaking the, the large audience? That's I mean, yeah, I'm, not, I'm not sure there is, but I think the, to, the other way, I think agreeing what you said is what, what your point is, and I think this comes up a lot, is that you can engineer a system to be real time be, without this before, but you had to be very, very careful, and not a lot of other things going on, and and on and on and on. Is that what your point, right? Right. So this is making it, you know, if you know more part of the system, and more people want to have, you know, more modern and other things can be going on, right? So it, it, a lot of it comes down to the system engineering burden, right? Yeah, I think we are over time now. But that, that's the idea of the, the event, is having these discussions. And uh, that's, that's the idea. It's good. Okay. So thank, thank you, you, Sebastian. <laughs>